All right, hello everyone and good evening. Welcome to the 2021 Women in Clean Energy Conference. We are so excited to have you here with us today and thank you so much for joining. This is our second year of hosting an all virtual event and I think this has really helped us open up opportunities for our audience and invite speakers from across the country. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ava Stokes and I'll be the moderator for the session tonight. I am a senior at the University of Dayton studying mechanical engineering and also pursuing my master's in renewable and clean energy. I've had the pleasure of working with an amazing team of women to plan a great conference for you this week, and I hope you find value in the topics and resources we have planned for you. Tonight's session is dedicated to clean energy regulation and policy. Policy, programs, and regulations are often the largest drivers of clean energy development within a state or utility. Incentives, renewables requirements, and even electricity rate structures all can have an enormous impact on the value of clean energy for both customers and developers. In the session, women will speak on clean energy policies on the local, state, and national levels that enable renewable development. We invite all attendees to submit questions through the Q&A feature during the session, and questions will be addressed at the conclusion of the presentations during the final panel session. I'd also all like to let you know that tonight's session will be recorded, and the recording will be posted on our website. Our first speaker tonight is Jay Spotswood. Jay is a staff attorney where she handles a wide range of legal matters. She is focused on transactional and litigation matters in the energy industry, and she has also had experience in advising clients on electricity rate cases. In addition, she has litigated on behalf of wind developers and assisted with due diligence in the sale of wind and solar energy companies. It is my pleasure to now hand it over to Jay. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me get my screen set up here. Okay, uh, so my name is Jay and I'll be talking to you tonight about uh, some policy trends and regulations um, as it pertains to our electric power grid. And, um, I said modernization-ish because um, as you'll learn, there are a lot of um, trends that are <laughs> not so modern. Um, but first we'll, we'll start out with what exactly is grid modernization? Um, so grid modernization is a catch-all phrase to refer to changes needed in the power grid. Um, and so those changes would need to accommodate all the rapid technological changes that um, we're seeing in the, in the industry. So that would, could mean energy storage, uh, demand response, um, battery powered micro, microgrids, which are some of the concepts we'll talk a little bit more about later. And um, since a lot of these policies are also driven locally, that can mean different things based on um, where you live, what state you live, or what region you live. Um, but it often applies to um, the increase of application of sensors, computers, and communication in our grid system, um, and, and basically increasing the intelligence of the grid, which is where we get the term smart grid. Um, so for some examples here um, I have listed is that a state might focus on upgrading transmission lines to connect more renewable energy sources to the power grid. And we'll talk more about transition lines later. So the main concept in uh, grid modernization is communication. Um, and so we need uh, our system to communicate just a, a ton of data um, real time, real time conditions of power flow um, or supply of uh, renewable energy um, to the grid so that we can ensure that we, we're properly managing those resources. Um, and grid modernization can affect any of the three ways electricity is delivered to us. Um, and that includes generation, which is your power, you know, your, your fossil fuel that's generating the actual power or solar or uh, wind um, and then, or transmission lines, which is on the diagram you'll see here, these are the large high voltage transmission lines um, that carry the power from long distances. And then it can also affect distribution lines, which is you know from how you get your, your electricity delivered to you. So to a residence or to a, to a commercial building. So grid modernization, grid policy can affect any one of those three levels. 
Um, so for, for our purposes tonight, we'll be uh, talking about uh, the items in bold. It's impossible to cover everything that grid modernization um, covers. Um, and so mainly when we talk about modernizing the grid, we're talking about actions that make our electricity system more resilient, responsive to real time use and interactive for consumers um, and getting consumers to participate more in, in managing the grid. And so typically legislative and regulatory actions will address any of these um, seven areas. It could go address smart grid or the way we buy and sell energy, regulatory reform, utility rate reform, energy storage demand response, but we'll be talking primarily about smart grid, um, some grid reform, energy storage and microgrids. So before we jump into the what, we're gonna talk a little bit about the why and uh, some of the reasons why it's important. And, and that's one of our current president's biggest initiative right now is modernizing our power grid is that, um, you know, we're trying to reduce carbon emissions. One of our big goal and one of the big talk of the town uh, when it comes to climate change is reducing um, how much um, carbon we're emitting into the environment. And so grid modernization, updating our, I don't know how many years, it's since the early, early 1900s, we've, we've had some of our, our, our systems in place, updating that to include variable renewable sources like wind and solar is important for driving um, down our current number um, of emissions to zero which is the goal, the goal ultimately. Um, and of course, it also supports the electric vehicle rev revolution as we integrate electric uh, charging stations into the grid. Um, and of course, it, it spreads urban and economic, uh, it spreads economic opportunity to urban and rural areas um, when we invest in updating these infrastructures. Um, and it just overall reduces costs. It reduces um, power out, out, outages, reduces the use when we can have like a concept like demand response, which is that takes um, real time information of, of um, when energy is in demand and encourages consumers to adjust their behavior for an incentive um, for you know a little bit of change off your bill or something like that. So that really it reduces costs overall. So a little bit about the players involved in uh, who's, making, who's making the rules. Congress, of course, um, the Department of Energy. We have FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which we'll be talking a lot about them. Uh, FERC determines the rules for how we buy and sell electricity on the wholesale market. Um, Two, third, two thirds of the nation's wholesale electricity sales occur on the competitive market. And it's managed by these organizations called RTOs or ISOs that were recommended by FERC. So FERC will issue rules that these RTOs and ISOs needs to, to implement and clarify for the, the wholesale market to operate. And then of course our state legislators and local public utilities commissions, as I mentioned before, a lot of these policies are locally controlled. So jumping into uh, the big, big talk of the town is President Biden's Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And um, a quick overview, I've got some stuff here that's um, just a broad view that uh, the plan wants to invest 65 billion to rebuild the electric grid. So what does that mean? So I think this was a, a little over a month ago on August 10th, the Senate passed the infrastructure investment bill. We're anticipating that it'll pass the house. I think Nancy Pelosi gave until September 27th for everyone to um, vote on this. Um, and the, the legislation includes several authorizing bills, including the Energy Infrastructure Act, which is what we're gonna talk about in detail. Of course, it also modernizes our bridge or trans, it does a lot of things, but we'll, it's broken up into these several bills and we're gonna focus on the Energy Infrastructure Act tonight. 
And so one of the things that it does is it, it completely overhauls our transmission system. So it, it creates a lot of incentives for us to invest in our transmission lines. Um, and so it requires the Department of Energy to study our capacity constraints and, and to focus on areas um, where we have transmission limitations that affect consumers and that information will be available to the states. It also provides um, FERC with authority to issue permits if state commission are dragging their foot or if they deny uh, uh, an application for, for a permit that would, a transmission line application. If, if, if a, uh, an applicant decides to apply for a permit and the process is going slow or they're denied for, for some reason, they can then go to FERC um, and seek approval, which is a pretty controversial idea because it's this whole, you know, federal versus states and whether the FERC is, is impeding on, on states, the state's authority. Um, it also directs um, FERC to initiate, to make, create rules that will make trans, the interregional transmission line uh, planning process a little bit easier. So where the RTOs and RTO and ISOs are divided into seven or nine, I know Texas is the only one that we'll talk about Texas, that they manage their own grid, but we have these RSOs and RTOs that manage the, the grid um, and the market. And so FERC can issue these overall rules in, uh, instructing them on, on how to go ahead and let people uh, change their uh, the planning process. Um, and then quickly, the bill also addresses smart grids. It provides uh, 19 billion in support for um, funding for building out the smart grid and for energy storage. It, it, it um, provides $3 billion for battery material processing and um, manufacturing and recycling grants. And then I'll jump into this really quick as you know, we're running for time, we're pressed for time. So the American Jobs Plan Act, this is not primarily an energy bill, but it does instruct um, or create investment tax credits to, that incentivizes the build out of over 20 gigawatts of high voltage capacity power line. Um, power lines. And so um, that's really important for us to uh, create a, a more resilient grid. So grid reform really focuses on clean, decentralized local power rather than having par um, plants that are far away and have to travel a, a long distance to get to us. So it really incentivizes having a newer, cleaner um, energy locally. Um, one of that, one, a big order that uh, was enacted last year by FERC, Order 222, is one that moves us further away from the traditional system of um, uh, how we sell, we wholesale um, power. And what it does is that it allows distributed energy resources, so that's your energy storage, your um, small generators, renewable energy sources, it allows them to play in the competitive market, wholesale market on, on a fair um, and, and level playing field. Whereas a lot of the rules did not apply to them. How do you make a rule for, you know, back in the 1900s for um, batteries where you don't use the energy immediately, you're, you're uh, generating that energy, storing it and using it for a later time. And so what FERC Order 22 does is it orders these ISOs and RTOs to implement rules that create, um, not that are not uh, discriminatory to these newer resources and to uh, modernize these rules to allow them to also participate in the electricity uh, market. And so quickly on energy storage, that's the hot topic um, in the last year and a half. Um, this slide just really describes what it is, which is what I mentioned. You know, you receive the energy, injects it later back into the grill, uh, the grid. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we didn't have rules. The, the assumption is that electricity consumption would be instantaneous. And so the rules did not really cater to that. And so a recent um, 
order clarification because the order was in place since 2018, but last year, uh, um, last February, the Court of Appeals clarified that um, federal regulators are the one who get to decide how batteries engage in transition scale power markets. And so RTOs and ISOs who govern the sale of um, energy on the competitive market, they are order to remove any barriers to the participation of electric storage uh, resources. And so the ruling really cleared the way for transmission operate and grid operators across the countries to open up their markets to energy storage um, so that they can compete on a level playing field. Um, and then jumping back to order 222, that also applies to your uh, behind the meter distributed energy resources, which behind the meter is anything that's generating energy on your property. Uh, so that could be a battery, a small generator. Um, FERC man, uh, mandates that those are allowed to enter the, and participate in wholesale energy markets as well. So these FERC order 222 and 841 are pretty big deals for modernizing the energy grid. Um, and a lot of states have been making policies as it pertains to energy storage. Um, I won't go through them in, 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 in details here, but Virginia has enact, enacted already two bills that you know uh, really uh, mandates utilities to integrate um, energy storage into their resource planning requirements and to remove local barriers to implementing energy storage Illinois also passed the bill, of course, California, um, Connecticut. And then I just have a, a map of, this is where what pretty much everything in green has taken some type of action uh, as it pertains to energy storage as of uh, earlier this year. And uh, the items in blue are, are states that are, are um, studying how to further implement energy storage. And so the last topic we'll talk about is um, microgrids, which microgrids are could be instrumental in preventing blackouts. I know a lot of you are familiar with the Texas blackout, and that came about um, because, well, one, Texas is uh, completely isolated in that it's, it manages its own uh, grid. It's not even subject to FERC's authority. And in 2011 and in 2014, when the local Public Utility Commission wanted to upgrade or, or set rules to upgrade the transmission lines, the utilities fought it and uh, it didn't happen. And, and of course we saw a loss of power for an extended time and unfortunately loss of lives. And what made that difficult was that they were not, states couldn't even send them surplus because they were not connected. And so microgrids can be um, a saving grace here because it's local, it's independent, um, and it's, it's kind of having your own small power. I know OSU, for example, has its own, uh, but it's powered by natural gas, but it, its own micro, microgrid, which was, I know, finalized, year before last year. Um, so the, this is just a map of where all the natural disasters occur and how a microgrid um, injecting locally um, could prevent some of these blackouts and, and, and um, disruption to power. Um, and so of course microgrids, they generate their own energy, manage and store um, that energy to go back into that local locality. Um, and it, it, could do, it could be connected to the larger grid. Uh, it could not be, um, the, 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 in my opinion, the more efficient ways of course and not is, is for it to be able to uh, function on its own uh, without being connected to the larger grid where it could um, connect in the sense of sending additional supply to the, the larger grid. Uh, so a few states have passed bills, Illinois, New York, Pennsylvania has passed bills to create microgrids. And then finally, um, there are a few projects here in Ohio. I know the local city council two days ago um, in uh, Cuyahoga County 
uh, passed a bill to establish a countywide utility that uh, where they they're, uh, want to establish this microgrid for at least these three areas, um, which are three high powered areas by the airport and the recent NASA Reach Research Center. Um, and also in the American Greetings headquarters. Um, and then I believe it was last month, um, it, the, the, House, the House of Representatives in Ohio passed the National Defense Authorization Act that authorizes or allocates $4.7 million to create and set up a microgrid um, at a military and civil airport in Ohio. Um, and so that provides that um, a way for uh, another grid to possibly supply energy, not only to the locality and to, to decrease the stress on the larger grid. Um, and then finally, grid modernization is also about equity. Um, you know, cutting ener energy bills is important to ending energy poverty, and I, 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 I think it was last week I was reading the report that um, large-scale transmission upgrades could cut consumer bills by more than 100 billion by 2050. Um, we know that a lot of these energy power out, outages affect um, poorer areas and they, they are impacted on a larger scale. And so federal plans that remove these barriers to uh, connect interregional connection and, and facilitating renewable energy into load centers will really help to sustain these areas that are energy deprived. And so with that, that's it for my section. Thank you so much, Jay. I would now like to introduce our second speaker for tonight, Sarah Spence. Sarah has built a career in policy development, government affairs, and political campaign expertise. She has worked on and managed political campaigns at the local, state, and national levels and brings more than 15 years of government affairs and policy experience. She has also been working on energy policy for nonprofits for the last four years. It's my pleasure to now hand it over to Sarah. Thanks, Ava, and I'm excited to be with you guys tonight. Um, see if I can... Oh, there we go. Awesome. So uh, tonight I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, state and local policy and what's going on here um, in Ohio. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, so I'm Sarah. I'm the executive director of the Ohio Conservative Energy Forum. I grew up in southeast Ohio. Um, again, have a, a government affairs background. Um, I got really involved in energy policy work actually when I work for the state of Ohio for the Facilities Construction Commission uh, and really learning about the ways that we can make buildings more energy efficient and use less water. Um, and so I uh, got really pretty fascinated in that and then decided to, to change my career path and, and actually start working in, in energy in the clean energy space. Um, so the Ohio Conservative Energy Forum, we were actually founded in 2015 uh, and it's a, a an organization that provides conservatives um, a forum to be able to discuss diverse all of the above energy portfolio. Um, and so that's something that we, um, you know, we believe a lot of times conservatives are not a part of clean energy conversations and we wanted to change that. Um, and so, you know, we talk a lot about clean energy transition um, and doing that in a way that supports free markets and protects property rights. Um, and this week actually is also National Clean Energy Week. Um, and so the Ohio Conservative Energy Forum is a part of a 21 state national network that is called a Conservative Energy Network. And we're actually also celebrating our fifth anniversary um, this year. So I'll go ahead and talk a little bit uh, about the Ohio state of play in, in energy policy. Um, so really the, the biggest thing that maybe some of you have heard of is House Bill 6. Um, but House Bill 6 actually has a pretty long history. Um, and so this started actually way back even in, in 1999 when the General Assembly decided to deregulate Ohio's electricity system. And so basically what that just entails is, um, you know, you have your utilities that actually own your like poles, wires, uh, and distributes your electricity to your house. 
Um, but the generation portion of it is actually now free market. Um, and so you as a Ohio consumer of electricity um, have a right to shop around for who supplies your energy needs. And so um, even though you live in a Dayton Power and Light territory, um, you can get a standard service offering from Dayton Power and Light, or you can actually um, shop the free market for, uh, for a different energy package. And that could be you're either trying to find something cleaner, um, trying to find something cheaper or best of both worlds, um, which is cleaner and cheaper. Um, and so from there in 2007, um, the General Assembly passed legislation that created renewable energy standards and energy efficiency standards for the state. Um, and those were actually pretty, pretty modest uh, goals. Um, it was renewable energy um, was only at a 12 and a half percent um, energy generation for the state uh, and energy efficiency was going to be 22 percent. Um, pretty shortly thereafter, um, and, and this actually had bipartisan support, um, when that legislation passed, I believe there was actually only one member of the House that voted against it. Um, so it was, at the time, definitely very well liked. Um, but shortly thereafter, they started kind of chipping away at both the renewable energy and energy efficiency standards through various different pieces of legislation, um, whether that was putting in a freeze uh, on the energy efficiency standards, um, actually kind of watering down what would count towards energy efficiency. Um, so just a lot of a lot of chipping away of those things. And at the same time, you know, renewable energy was really starting to, to come onto the market. Prices were starting to go down. Um, and so some of the older generation models um, with nuclear uh, and coal plants were becoming more expensive to operate. And so they started having discussions uh, over, you know, how we could subsidize or support um, some of these other generation facilities. Um, and it, it kind of all came together in House Bill 6. Um, and so what we actually found out later um, after House Bill 6 was passed um, was that there was a lot of corruption that actually went behind it. And so um, First Energy had uh, kind of funneled, you know, $60 million into um, Speaker Householders uh, C4 uh, organization um, to help with, uh, you know, electing representatives and, and helping to kind of sway votes and, and that kind of thing. So House Bill 6 really kind of changed the landscape of Ohio energy policy. And so that piece of legislation um, created a subsidy for Ohio's two nuclear plants. Uh, it created a subsidy for two coal plants. Uh, one of them is actually not even located in Ohio. It's actually in the state of Indiana. Um, and it also got rid of our energy efficiency standards and our renewable energy standards. Um, once the, the scandal broke, um, the General Assembly has kind of piecemealed, rolled back a lot of provisions within House Bill 6. So the nuclear energy provision is gone. Um, so we are no longer um, paying to subsidize those, those nuclear plants that were owned by uh, First Energy Solutions, now Energy Harbor. Um, we are, there were a, a couple of other um, Pieces of legislation, yeah, pieces of legislation that kind of helped First Energy get more profits, and so those pieces are gone as well. Um, however, the um, the nuclear, or sorry, the coal plant subsidies remain, so that is still law. We are still subsidizing those, um, and the energy efficiency and renewable energy standards were not um, replaced, so we still no longer have those. Um, and then after. So after all of that happens, um, we then ended up getting into um, House Bill 201. Um, and so there was a lot of conversation about um, localities moving towards 100% renewable energy um, and wanting to have more control over uh, where they, they get their energy and what types of energy they use. Um, and so the, the Ohio House ended up introducing a piece of legislation, House Bill 201, that would prohibit localities from prohibiting natural gas within their, their territory. So it was like a ban of the bans. Um, and so this piece of legislation um, passed the, the General Assembly. Um, OSEF actually ended up supporting this piece of legislation, um, but that was because we had worked with the natural gas industry to get an amendment that was a, a carve out for 
community choice aggregation. Um, and so Ohio is one of, uh, I believe now nine states in the nation that allows for community choice aggregation. And basically what this does, it allows the city uh, to put before voters whether or not they would like to kind of pool their energy purchases together to be able to bulk purchase energy. Um, and with that, you can do a really a lot of cool things with clean energy as far as um, having 100% um, clean energy. You can use recs or you can actually um, have a certain percentage built within a certain radius of your locality that you would then use to help supply power for your, um, your city. And we wanted to make sure that that was still a viable option for cities to be able to have 100% clean energy um, within their, their cities. And so we were able to actually work out an amendment that uh, carved out community choice aggregation from that bill. Um, and so that way municipalities now still have the option if they use community choice aggregation to go 100% clean energy um, and, and do not have to use natural gas as part of the, the mixture. Um, and so if you're kind of catching on to the theme of the state house is not exactly friendly to clean energy, you're correct in that. Um, assumption. And so then we ended up with uh, Senate Bill 52. And so Senate Bill 52 really concentrates on uh, siting for renewable projects. And so uh, the General Assembly, uh, a lot of General Assembly members were hearing from their local constituents that they felt like they didn't have a voice or a say in where projects were, um, were being sited, how large they were. Um, you know, there were um, people that were complaining that they were going to be, you know, surrounded on three sides of their property by solar panels. Um, and then a lot of misinformation, you know, just about the toxicity of, of solar panels leaching into the ground and, and contaminating water, um, you know, just different things with noise and noise pollution and light pollution for wind. And, and so the General Assembly kind of started out with um, a piece of legislation that would have given complete local control at the township level um, for siting wind, uh, wind and solar projects. And so this is completely like different from how they cite any other or any other energy generation source in the state of Ohio. Um, so if you're looking to build a nuclear plant or a coal plant or a natural gas plant, all of those are cited at a, a statewide level. Um, and until Senate Bill 52, all of the renewable energy over a certain megawatt was also cited through the, the state, through the Ohio Power Siting Board. And this really gave, you know, some um, some credence and, and there were you know, professionals that are looking at this. Um, they're, you know, they work with like the Department of uh, Natural Resources, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and you know, looking at environmental impact and impact to wildlife. Um, and so that has now been kind of taken to the local level. So through the, um, the process, the legislative process with Senate Bill 52, um, there was definitely a lot of opposition from um, well, one, obviously renewable energy companies. However, there were a lot of businesses um, and what we like to call the, the big six uh, at the state house, which are um, kind of like your larger associations. Um, so, uh, you know, the Ohio Farm Bureau, um, the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, Ohio Manufacturing Association and others that were like, this is kind of a slippery slope of, of you know, kind of coming in and, and changing the, the, the rules of the game. Um, and pushing everything to the local level. And so through a lot of back and forth um, and a lot of compromise, uh, Senate Bill 52 ended up coming out as, so now if you are a renewable energy project within the state of Ohio, you have to get county approval for your project. And so before you file with the Ohio Power Siting Board, you would have to actually go to a county commissioner's meeting, um, kind of present your plan. The county commissioners then have 90 days. And if they decide to do nothing, then you can just move forward with your plan. Um, or they can decide to vote to um, not allow you to develop in the area or um, work with you to modify like the footprint of the project. Um, so it adds a little bit more um, regulation onto the, the siting of these projects. Um, it also adds in a provision. So when this bill um, goes into effect, it's not in effect yet, 
But when it does go into effect on, um, I believe, October 9th, it does give county commissioners the authority to create um, no development zones within their, their county. Um, and so, and this can be anywhere from an entire countywide ban to um, a like portions of their county uh, where they can ban renewable energy development from taking place. Um, and so, uh, Fortunately, we're not hearing of a lot of counties that are going to jump on that. Um, we do know a couple, though, that I think, um, you know, once that the bill goes into effect, they will probably jump on it and, and ban uh, either wind or solar or both um, from happening within, within their counties. Um, so I will say one of the good, I guess if there is a bright spot of Senate Bill 52, is we were able to get um, a lot of solar kind of grandfathered through. So um, solar projects that have already gotten their um, initial impact study from PJM. Um, so Ohio is within the, the, the PJM territory. Um, if they've already met that standard, then they are grandfathered. Uh, and so they don't have to go through all that county approval process. They would go through the previous traditional um, power siding board process. Um, so at least we know that there, there will be um, still significant solar development that will be going on and they don't have to use the Senate Bill 52 process. So I'll talk a little bit about like kind of our, um, our state priorities kind of moving forward um, in this um, kind of with that background going on. Um, and so one is energy waste reduction. And so this is uh, currently introduced, it's House Bill uh, 3, 89. It's a bipartisan bill, actually. Um, Representative Seitz is a Republican. Uh, Representative Leland is a Democrat. Um, and they, after the whole House Bill 6 um, fiasco kind of happened, um, it, House Bill 6 language wasn't really clear um, when it came to energy efficiency. They were, the General Assembly kept saying that with this legislation, if a utility wanted to continue um, an energy efficiency program, they could do it voluntarily. Um, so we had a couple of, of utilities that actually applied at the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio to do energy efficiency, and they were told by staff that they actually don't have the authority to do voluntary programs. Um, and so this piece of legislation has actually been kind of in the works for like the last six months um, with various stakeholders, um, environmental groups, utilities, uh, and working out a way to at least bring back voluntary programs uh, to the state of Ohio. Um, so it, it will be voluntary. Uh, it will be an opt out for residential consumers. Um, so you, you'll automatically be enrolled into this energy uh, waste reduction program. Um, but every so often, if you decide that you don't like it and don't want to pay the fee for it, you can opt out. Um, I will say that one of the good things is, is it does tighten up a lot of the energy efficiency um, items of what you can count towards energy efficiency. So you're actually getting kind of true energy efficiency and not getting credit for. So like previously, if a utility sent out, um, you know, one of those flyers that you may have gotten, um, that's like, your neighbors use so much percentage less electricity than you do. And it kind of shames you into maybe like turning off lights more often or, you know, upgrading to an LED light bulb, whatever. Um, they used to be able to count that. And so they're not gonna be able to count things like that anymore. So um, that's actually a really good thing. Um, the other piece that we're really kind of excited to work on and we'll hopefully have introduced here in the next couple of weeks is community solar. Um, and so community solar is a way that it kind of, um, bridges that middle gap right now that we have in the state of Ohio. So you're allowed to put a solar system on your roof. Um, so you yourself as an individual can, can have solar power on your roof um, and we can do utility scale size solar. Um, so community solar is kind of like that nice in between. Um, they're usually smaller, um, smaller megawatt projects. Um, but if you as, a, um, as an individual wants to have solar power for your house, um, but maybe like your roof is shaded or um, just structurally like not viable to have solar panels on. Um, you can actually like buy into like a subscription, buy into a, a community solar array. Um, and so that will definitely open up the market, I think a lot more um, for people who would like to have solar, but 
maybe for one reason or another can't have it on on you know on their roofs or like if they rent or those kind of things um i mean this could also allow for um we, there's like a great project that's going on in cleveland uh in the huff neighborhood that they can do because it's um they're a municipal utility and so they have a little bit more flexibility um but they're talking about having just like the the huff neighborhood um build a couple of, of solar arrays um on vacant properties that they have and then uh, members of the neighborhood would would buy into that um, solar um, solar project. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is electric vehicle manufacturing. Uh, Ohio has a long and proud history um, in auto manufacturing, and so we know that um, there are a lot of of car companies, you know, Ford, GM, Volvo, that have all made announcements of you know how they're moving towards an all electric vehicle um, fleet, um, some by 2030, some by 2050. Um, and so we know that electric vehicles are coming um, and we need to be making them here in Ohio to be able to take advantage of that. Um, and so we also need to be getting, um, you know, back to kind of Jay's presentation, our, our grid ready for being able to, to charge electric vehicles um, and to be able to do it in a way that all Ohioans can have access to it um, and there aren't barriers, um, whether that's within uh, rural regions of Ohio or in some of our, our poorer areas of Ohio. Um, and so that's something that we're definitely active and involved in. And then finally, um, on the local level, there is um, a really cool campaign partnership um, with a bunch of organizations, um, OSEF included, um, so it's a lot of environmental organizations, businesses, um, renewable energy developers, um, chambers of commerce uh, that have all gotten together um, to create this campaign called Power Clean Future Ohio. Um, and Power Clean Future Ohio is really cool. Um, we work on the local level with cities to help them reduce their carbon footprint um, in an equitable and economic way. And so we are now at, uh, I believe now, 19 cities that are Power Clean Future Ohio cities, which is great. Um, we have small cities, we have small villages, we have very large cities. Um, Cleveland actually just joined, so they're our, our 19th community. Um, Dayton is one of our, our communities as well, so we're excited that we're working with Dayton. Um, and so what we do is, this is it's free for communities to join. Um, and this coalition helps provide technical expertise and resources to help cities uh, reduce their carbon footprint. Um, and so like one of our partners is Clean Fuels Ohio. And so if you become a, a Power Clean Future Ohio city, Clean Fuels will help you do a fleet analysis of the, the city's fleet, where it stands, um, and how to be able to transition that to an all electric fleet. Um, and so then we also have other partners um, that help with energy efficiency and talk with um, you know, cities as they're going to renovate their city halls, like how do we get solar on the roof and, and also do uh, energy efficiency um, things within the, the, the budget um, of, your, of your renovation. And so um, those are some really cool um, things that we've gotten to work with. Um, we're working with the city of Euclid now on doing a complete sustainability uh, plan for the city. Um, so that's pretty exciting as well. Um, and then kind of something that's unique to OSEF, um, one of the projects that we have actually is called the Ohio Land and Liberty Coalition. Um, and the Ohio Land and Liberty Coalition is a grassroots organization that really goes and talks to local elected officials, um, local landowners, and talking about the importance of renewable energy, um, and really especially in the farming community how um, renewable energy can actually help diversify their um, their funding streams so they can they can withstand you know a really bad weather year um, with certain crops they actually have money that's coming in from land leases for their renewable energy projects um, and this is also a great way to it it conserves farmland um, so instead of them having to sell out their um, their property or their farm um, to, you know, like a housing development or any kind of other development, they can actually lease this land, um, they can put on solar panels um, or, or wind turbines um, and have that land be used for that for, you know, 30, 40 years. And then those things can actually be taken off and they can reuse the farmland. Um, so it's a great way to preserve farmland. And so this is just, you know, one of the ways that, that we reach out to people uh, to encourage 
renewable energy uh, within the state. And I think with that, that is uh, kind of the end of my presentation. And so you can just see um, the organizations that I, I mentioned, um, how you can learn more about us. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Finally, I'd like to now introduce Randy Lepla. Randy is the Vice President of Energy Policy and Lead Energy Council at the Ohio Environmental Council, where she works to advance clean energy and energy efficient policies and projects. She also works with utilities and businesses to create and implement plans for carbon pollution reductions and advance energy policies through advocacy, communications, partnerships, and litigation. It is my pleasure to now hand it over to Randy. Thank you, Ava. I think I'm going to do the same thing and try and make sure I've got control of the screen. Oh, all right, great. Oh, I went too far. All right, sorry, guys. Um, well, good evening, everybody. It's great to be with you guys tonight. Um, I am, as Ava said, uh, the Vice President of Energy Policy and Lead Energy Council for Ohio Environmental Council. Um, so I'm an attorney licensed here in Ohio. Um, and uh, you know, do a lot of our clean energy work and also manage our energy program at OVC. Um, I've been here about five and a half years. I originally joined the team as our clean energy attorney. Um, so I was exclusively doing our, um, our litigation on clean energy policy, mostly at the Public Utilities Commission and Power Siting Board. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I took over managing our program on energy holistically. So I remain uh, involved in our cases, but I'm uh, taking lead on, um, you know, kind of the, the direction and development of our policies and priorities here at OEC. Um, so before I got here, I was in private practice for about six years. Um, so I did a lot of wind siting um, and also some natural gas issues in the state. Um, and when the posting came up at OEC, I wanted to go uh, do the energy work that I've been doing um, kind of off and on and part-time um, in a full-time capacity. So that's how I ended up at OEC. Um, so um, I just wanted to quickly give you guys kind of an overview. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to talk about how we get involved in energy policy in the state. Um, but first, I just wanted to give you guys a little history and an overview of what OEC is and who we are and what we do. Um, we were founded back in 1969 um, in uh, response to the Cuyahoga River fires, actually. Um, there was more than one. There's just one very famous one. Um, so we've been around about 52 years, and our mission is to secure healthy air, land, and water for all Ohio, all Ohio home. Um, so our team focuses on energy, water, and public lands. And we also added a fourth priority of democracy because we cannot have um, a clean Ohio if we don't have a clean and uh, healthy democracy. So we are a family of organizations while OEC is 52 years old, um, about five or six years ago now. Um, we also started a sister organization, the OEC Action Fund, and it is a C4. So that is what we do all of our advocacy work for, uh, through at the um, uh, at the state house. So our team's work really revolves around, um, or I'm sorry, uh, all of those priorities that I was saying, and this is kind of who does it at our office. So I, like I said, I'm our VP. Um, Nolan Rushling is our director of climate programs. He just started last week actually with the OEC. He came to us from Ohio Hospital Association. He was doing, uh, working as their energy program director. Um, and then Chris Tavener is our staff attorney, and he is part of our law center, but he also works uh, very closely with the energy team. And then we are adding a fourth position to our energy team. Our new position is energy justice fellow. Um, and really excited about this position. Um, this is something I've been uh, working toward getting uh, onboarded for a long time. We have done a lot of work over the last several years to make sure that all of our policies that we are moving forward um, are equitable um, because we cannot move forward um, in this environment if we're not thinking about all the people that we've left behind uh, because of these regressive energy policies we have in Ohio. Um, so that is, um, you know, this new fellow position is really trying to make sure that we bring uh, an environmental and energy justice lens to every decision we're making um, at every level of government um, and in our policy work. So, so that's a little bit about our team. Um, and so, uh, like I said, you know, our team's uh, work revolves directly around trying to find ways to reduce greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases, excuse me, quickly, efficiently, and equitably um, to really mitigate the worst impacts of climate change, um, period. That's our, our main goal. Um, so how are we doing with this transition? 
Um, this uh, pie chart is from 2018. Um, so just to give you a, a taste of this, um, the good news is really that we rapidly, rapidly decreased electricity coming from coal generation from nearly 90% in the late 2000s um, to under 60% in 2016. And then you can see in this graph, just two years later, it fell to 47% of the share. So that's really great news, but we're still the sixth highest emitter in the country of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and as you can see, our renewables growth has been pretty stagnant. I know this is 2018 and it's getting better. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the great stuff we're seeing in the solar uh, field uh, come online. Um, but we still have a lot of work left to do. And it, as you can see, um, based on this, the natural gas has really um, filled the gap uh, in the space left by coal instead of renewables. Um, so given what we know about the uh, impact of greenhouse gases on climate change, and especially if you were uh, took a look at the most recent IPCC report, we just don't have any more time to waste in Ohio or anywhere else in the world. Um, so I'm going to kind of walk you through our work on statewide policy and also at the agency level. Like I said, we get involved at PUCO and OPSB, um, as well as the work that we're doing at the local level to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so the state house. Um, <laughs> There is a lot going on at the State House right now. Um, and Sarah covered most of it, so I won't belabor any of those, but um, the, the pieces that we're really working on um, focus on uh, right now, focusing on repealing those two remaining bad components of uh, House Bill 6. So um, the extended and expanded subsidies for OVAC that Sarah talked about, um, previously those were actually, they went through the Public Utilities Commission. So those were approved through a case process that was contested by parties like uh, the OEC that got involved there. Um, and then they were decided that way. So there was this a much longer process to determine whether or not those subsidies were appropriate. Um, what House Bill 6 did was extend those through 2030 and they were set to close uh, or expire between 2023 and 2025, depending on uh, which of the utilities we were talking about, um, and only three of our electric distribution utilities uh, were receiving subsidies before House Bill 6. So AEP, uh, DPNL, which is AES now, um, and Duke were all receiving those subsidies. And I say that uh, this subsidy was expanded because First Energy um, also, uh, their customers are also paying for this now. So before it was just uh, three-fourths of the distribution utilities in the state um, whose customers had to pay for this bailout, and now it's all of us in the state of Ohio that are under electric distribution territory. Um, and so as Sarah mentioned, um, also the clean energy standards are repealed. So that's our, our renewable portfolio standard and our energy efficiency work. So we are looking at trying to find ways to, to knock those down. So energy waste reduction legislation that Sarah talked about, um, there was set sponsor testimony today. We're expecting to be able to testify on that next week. So uh, uh, through OEC action funds, so we're really excited about that progressing. Um, and then as Sarah mentioned, uh, the two OVEC repeal bills that are pending um, today, uh, Representative Lanise talked about House Bill 351. Um, and Senate Bill 117 through uh, Senator Romanchuk is the other, um, the, the companion bill on the other side of the uh, um, uh, legislature um, that's pending. So we are um, hopeful that those will move this, this cycle, uh, but we'll see, you never know with uh, <laughs> how things are gonna shake out at the state house. Um, so I wanted to mention those, but I also, um, and this is not on my slide because uh, it was too soon to share it um, when I had to send these in to, to the folks at UD. Um, but we're really, really excited that today, um, I'm sorry, yesterday, um, Representatives Casey Weinstein and Representative Stephanie House introduced the Energy Jobs and Justice Act and uh, got a bill number today. So it's House Bill 429 if you're interested in looking it up. And the whole point of this bill is to turn the page on all of the bad things that Sarah ran through um, about you know, the way energy policy has worked here in Ohio. Um, it's not worked for all Ohioans. It's worked to really benefit our utilities. Um, and it got to a point where we were able to have a $61 million bribery scheme uh, that happened right under some of our noses, right um, in the middle of, uh, you know, a fight to, to stop this bad legislation that passed with House Bill 6. So the, the goal here is to really turn the page and to talk about what we need. I think there's really good movement and a recognition that House Bill 6 was the wrong way to go, um, both because of the bribery, but also the policy. Uh, there wasn't really any evidence, uh, ultimately, that First Energy needed that nuclear subsidy. Um, there was no, uh, obviously no other uh, notification that they needed some of those uh, goodies that Sarah said that also got repealed. Um, and, and we're seeing these good bills that are pending with energy waste reduction legislation and a recognition that we should not be bailing out antiquated coal plants, especially when one's not even in our state. Um, so the three kind of policy priorities for the Energy Jobs and Justice Act are equity, 
um, carbon emissions reduction and transparency and accountability. And the way this is going to, this way this legislation is laid out, um, there are really important just transition components in here. There are really important workforce development programs that really reduce that structural and institutional barriers that have historically been faced by Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, as well as communities with low incomes. So um, to elaborate on the workforce development piece, um, this really, the goal is to prioritize those that have been historically and disproportionately harmed by our regressive energy policies, as I said. Um, there's a piece uh, called the Clean Jobs Training Program, which prioritizes training for members of the BIPOC community, individuals that are aging out of foster care, environmental justice communities, communities with low incomes, and reentering citizens. So these are really, the, what I love about this is that these are holistic programs. Um, it takes into account the fact that people have to have childcare to be able to go to these programs. Um, it also provides uh, transportation to and from those trainings um, so that you can actually make sure that you can get there when you have this opportunity. Um, and it will provide, there's a, a component that will require um, curriculum to be determined by a collaborative process so that these uh, programs are training people to become the next, um, uh, you know, workforce of the clean energy industry. And solar and wind, uh, solar installer and wind technician are two of the fastest growing um, job sectors in the country, actually. Um, so this is something that, you know, we can actually take advantage of. It's kind of a win-win, right? We're taking advantage of uh, economic development. We're uh, lifting up populations that have been left behind, and we're also making way headway on um, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so the Clean Jobs Training Program. There's a, a companion kind of program called the Ohio Jumpstart Clean Jobs Training Program that's added into this as well, um, and that is the same type of curriculum to the extent it can be that can be taught in. Um, uh, for uh, incarcerated individuals in Ohio. And so I believe the way it's laid out is they, uh, within one year of, um, uh, of being released to reenter into society, they can apply for these and then also have uh, that really great uh, skill set and opportunity um, that other Ohioans are taking advantage of so that when they uh, are reentering society, they have the, the opportunity to get those types of jobs. Um, the legislation also supports new minority um, clean energy businesses. It provides low interest loans through new link deposit program. Um, it provides mentoring and training and business development opportunities. Um, and then there's also an Ohio BIPOC clean energy accelerator program to provide two year mentorships to already existing um, businesses that are working in clean energy and led by um, black indigenous or people of color to make sure that we are um, putting them on equal footing with others um, in the clean energy industry. So really, really excited about that. And, and also the just transition component of this equity piece is really critical. Um, you know, we've been talking about these OVAC subsidies and we shouldn't be propping up old dirty uh, fossil fuel plants anymore. They're closing all over the country. And as I mentioned, you know, a significant amount of coal um, has been retired in Ohio alone um, since just 2006, right? It was 90% in 2006 and now we're at 2018 and it's down to 47. So that's a huge amount of coal, um, you know, being removed from our system. So we really need to think about um, how we're going to help the communities where these plants, you know, those communities have borne the brunt of, uh, you know, producing electricity for the for the whole state and outside in our PGM footprint. Um, and they're going to also, uh, they've also suffered the pollution impacts because that's burning right in their backyard. Um, and so what are we going to do as we have to close these plants down? We need to make sure that those um, residents of those communities have another opportunity um, and so this creates a fund to assist with that transition and make sure there's um, you know, additional uh, retraining if need be and finding ways to make sure that that community is not losing its entire tax base as the, uh, the plant shuts down right away. So that's a really important component as well. Um, as far as the carbon emissions reduction goes, um, there are uh, the ultimate goal is 100% carbon free by 2050. And then there are interim benchmarks, uh, including 50% by 2030. And then a requirement that the Public Utilities Commission set interim benchmarks um, through a rulemaking process. Um, there are also lots of components, um, kind of some of the things Sarah was talking about that got passed in House Bill 201 and uh, Senate Bill 52, trying to level the playing field for renewable energy um, uh, and also fixing our wind siding setbacks. Um, I think, uh, I don't think Sarah touched on this, but in 2014, um, our wind siting requirements were changed as uh, with a with a, a sneaky little amendment to the budget bill. Um, it wasn't really debated at all, and there was no conversation around it. And that has led to a real, real problem where we don't have hardly any wind energy coming online. 
um, in the state. So it fixes that aspect and then also does um, uh, reinstate uh, our energy waste reduction, uh, previously called our energy efficiency um, um, our EERS, our efficiency requirements. Um, so reinstates that to make sure that we're actually prioritizing um, getting rid of the fat, right, in our in our energy system, making sure that we're not just wasting energy um, because that helps everybody's wallets. It helps us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions because the cheapest and cleanest kilowatt hour is the one we're not using. Um, so that's a really important component of our carbon reduction um, component in this bill as well. And then the final piece, um, which I think is really innovative and exciting, um, there's a huge section on transparency and accountability. And so this bill creates the Office of Energy Justice. So it will ensure PUCO decisions are guided by and benefit from the principles of energy justice. Um, because right now there's no requirement that that is uh, factored in really <laughs> into Public Utilities Commission decisions. And they exist to make sure that we can all um, have access to energy, but also to make sure that it's done in a manner that serves the public and serves Ohio. So we need to make sure that that's equitable. And so that's a really important component of this. Um, so, um, so again, like I said, I mean, we really can't afford any more of these piecemeal approaches in Ohio. We don't have time to waste if we're really serious about fighting climate change. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that we're not coming up again against other utility sponsored roadblocks. And so we really are excited to see um, this comprehensive energy policy um, that prioritizes equitable solutions for Ohioans. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about it, um, you can visit the website uh, related to it. It's www.energyjobsandjustice.org. So I'd encourage you to check that out and you can sign up for more information if you're interested in uh, getting updates. So um, next, like I said, OEC is very engaged, the Public Utilities Commission and the Power Siting Board. Um, and Sarah covered kind of the, the efficiency pieces, but I had on here, um, and I forgot Duke, poor Duke, um, but AEP, uh, DPNL, or AES now, and Duke all um, submitted voluntary efficiency program proposals as part of their demand side management um, cases. And um, those are probably not going anywhere for a lot of the reasons Sarah discussed and, and I mentioned earlier about um, kind of the, the process problems with, are we supposed to be looking at legislation? Should we wait for that to come down? Um, so those aren't probably going anywhere, but um, a number of uh, uh, environmental organizations that we work with, we fought um, in the AEP case uh, pretty hard to try to get those um, back into the program because it made a lot of sense. And right now under the Ohio Revised Code, utilities should and can uh, propose these voluntary efficiency programs. And it was very clear that they were gonna be a cost benefit for Ohioans. Um, so we would love to see those in there again and not to uh, belabor uh, you guys with web websites, but uh, we did uh, provide testimony in that case from Brendan Batts, who's with Gable Associates. So he testified in that case about the benefits of energy waste reduction. Um, and you can check that out at www.ohioenergywastereduction.com if you're interested in learning more about the benefits that um, are included in that. Um, another part of the energy efficiency piece, the Public Utilities Commission um, announced they're going to have workshops on this. They were originally scheduled to start, I think, next month. Um, and they were really, really spread out. So they were going to start in October, I think, and there were three sessions um, within the, like the first two months, and then some of them uh, were pushed into January, uh, uh, late, maybe maybe just January of next year. So instead of doing that, I think in part probably because of all the different things and pieces moving at the Public Utilities Commission, at um, the State House, um, those have now been bumped to January. So I think uh, it's, they're uh, accepting comments through January 28th, and then there will actually be um, energy efficiency workshops that stakeholders can attend and provide input on. Um, so I think that that's a really critical part of this, um, but it's just too soon to tell what's going to happen with energy efficiency policy in the state, um, because you do have all these different uh, areas in which it's being debated. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, another, as, uh, as you heard from Sarah on the House Bill 6 scandal, um, there is a lot going on trying to unpack what happened with First Energy and uh, the bribery scandal. Um, so there are four different investigations happening right now at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, and they, they do have a page where you can kind of go through and understand the differences between these. Um, but they've had several different um, uh, audits that have gone through. Um, and a couple of them, a uh, most recent one that came out, identified that there were some issues, but nothing major. Uh, and then when you take a look at the report, it really calls out some of the 
um, the issues with uh, how uh, First Energy was using the funds that it collected from ratepayers and whether or not that was uh, inappropriate because they're not supposed to be using our money uh, for different lobbying endeavors, especially when it's, uh, it turns into a bribery scandal after the fact. So um, so that's a really interesting one, um, a set of cases to keep in touch with. We would have loved to see, and we asked uh, the Public Utilities Commission to combine those cases because it gets really complicated when you're kind of trying to narrow in on some discovery in one case um, that overlaps with another. Um, and so far they've uh, declined to, to combine those cases, but that is um, something else that we're kind of pushing for still as well. Um, as far as uh, the power siding board. So um, Sarah gave you kind of the insight on what was happening with Senate Bill 52. Um, and you know our opinion and um, our thinking on this was that a lot of those issues with folks feeling like they weren't, their voices weren't heard at the power siding board, or that they, you know, didn't have enough access um, because it is, you know, you have to get involved to get involved in a case. You might have to hire a lawyer or you represent yourself. And if you're not an attorney, you might not understand the process. So there were a lot of things that could have been fixed um, as part of the power siding board process and that we believe need to be fixed. Um, but our opinion was not to take a hatchet to it with Senate Bill 52. We would have preferred an, a real discussion about what the problems were. Um, because there is an upcoming rulemaking process. And it was supposed to, it did start actually, um, right before COVID hit. Um, it was one of my last in-person meetings, I think, in March of 2020. Um, and we had a good discussion amongst different stakeholders about um, the, the flaws in the power siding board rulemaking and the public input component. Um, and then, um, you know, we didn't hear much of anything for quite a while. And only um, in the last couple of weeks, we did get a notification that um, the power siding board rulemaking process is going to go forward, um, and they are collecting input about those administrative rules that address applications for um, not just the electric generation facilities that Sarah was talking about, which include wind and solar, but also electric transmission lines and gas pipelines. So that's kind of their wheelhouse. Um, so they are taking um, feedback from interested stakeholders, uh, and then that will be incorporated into, and usually in a rulemaking process, they just draft rules, what they think it should be, and then they have a formal um, uh, comment period and you can go testify, but these are actually prior to that uh, session. And this is gonna allow them to take these comments and hopefully factor them into the draft rules that they present. And then there will be that formal process where we can all uh, provide input in a, a formal capacity as well. And so those are starting uh, October 4th and October 8th. There are two on the 4th and one on the 8th. So. Um, just flagging that in case anybody's interested in getting involved in that process. Anybody is welcome to get involved, and I'm sure they'd love to hear from folks um, in different communities that are interested in this. Um, the next one, um, we were very involved in the offshore wind case in Lake Erie uh, Project Icebreaker. Um, so that, after a very tumultuous um, <laughs> back and forth, um, including uh, what, what a lot of folks call the poison pill that was uh, input by former chair Sam Randazzo, um, that has now been pulled out. Um, that, that case has been approved um, and has been appealed by uh, two landowners that are opposed to the project uh, to the Supreme Court. And we just found out yesterday um, that they finally scheduled the oral arguments in that case. So briefing has closed. Um, the OEC filed um, an amicus brief in that case. Um, and oral arguments will be on December 7th. And then um, you know, probably won't hear a ruling until early spring at best, I would guess. And then um, if that's approved, that case is fully, fully uh, vetted and uh, done. Um, and that case has been in process um, and just in, in theory and in the idea of having offshore wind in Lake Erie for over a decade. Um, and it would be the first freshwater offshore wind project uh, in North America. So uh, pretty precedent setting uh, case if that's able to move forward, um, which we're excited about. So um, wind, I kind of covered this. Um, there's only been one project approved uh, under the 2014 setback distances. And so wind has just been stagnant in the state, unfortunately, since then. Um, but there, you know, a couple of projects, uh, there had been, it may not seem that way because there were projects that had either been grandfathered in because of the way the language was, um, and they'd still been in the process of construction, but only one has been approved under those actual uh, extended setbacks. Um, but like I said, solar is doing really well. This is uh, not to, no pun intended, a bright spot in Ohio uh, policy right now. Um, I know this map is really tiny, so you probably can't see it um, too well, but um, just there are, it's um, 
over, let's see, certificated project totals, there's over 3,643 uh, approved projects for solar. So that's a huge amount um, to come online. And then there are other projects in the queue that are not certificated yet, but it's over 4,000 megawatts of, um, of solar um, that would come online if those cases are approved. And like Sarah said, um, Senate Bill 52 did grandfather those projects in that had already gone, been already applied for. Um, so all of these cases that are in process um, can move forward with, uh, without um, being subject to the Senate Bill 52 guidelines. Um, so communities can't vote these out at this point, um, but anything going forward, um, that will be an issue. So um, moving on, so we are also like Sarah and uh, Ohio Conservative Energy Forum, we are also involved in the Power Clean Future Ohio work. And um, we're just really incredibly proud of this work because, you know, as we look at trying to fight climate change, we have to find every way we can find it, uh, fight it as, as we can. So um, finding these carbon uh, emissions reductions at the community level, level is a huge deal. And as you can see, I have 18 communities listed because Cleveland joined after I submitted my slides. So we do have 19, as Sarah said, um, across the state. Um, and and like I like we said, you know, this is a really um, I think this is a really unique effort um, because we talk to communities, we ask them, you know, what they need. Um, we put them in touch with uh, a lot of technical experts and expertise um, to provide those tools and resources that they really need to make this fit for their community. Um, so uh, and this is probably higher now, obviously, with Cleveland joining, um, but the current uh, percentage of PCFO communities, it represents 10 percent of Ohio's population. So that's a really big deal. Um, and we expect this to keep growing um, because we, we see the demand for clean energy at the local level, even when we have these huge roadblocks often at the state level um, with our with our current legislature. So it's really exciting to see this move forward. Um, and, you know, I would just encourage you, if you see your community on this map and you're interested in getting involved, obviously Dayton's involved and that's really exciting, but we might have people tuning in from across the state. Um, so if you don't see your community on here or if you do, reach out to your uh, lawmakers and, and thank them and ask how you can get involved. And if you have ideas, I would certainly recommend you let them know. If your community is not on here, um, also write your legislators or go talk to somebody in your local government and tell them you're excited about this um, because this is a really unique way for uh, your local community to get engaged in and have a lot of these free resources through PCFO um, that otherwise are pretty tough for some local communities to, to take advantage of. So. Um, so that is all I had, um, but i um, happy to talk uh, more with anybody if you're interested in any of the work we're talking about. And um, just another plug again for the Energy Jobs and Justice Act. I'm just really, really excited about this and, um, you know, changing the narrative in the state of Ohio about what clean energy policy can and should look like and how it can help all Ohioans. So I will turn it back over to you, Ava. Thank you so much, Randy, and thank you to all three speakers for providing really amazing and inspirational insight in the work you're doing, and thank you for all of your contributions to this field. I would now like to invite all the speakers back on for the Q&A portion of the session this evening. So we have a few questions in the chat. Um, I believe this first one is for Jay. Are the government inf infrastructure bills to modernize the grid allocated only to government organizations or are private companies also con contracted? Sorry, I was on mute there. <laughs> I think I'd get the hang of this after a year and a half of the pandemic. Um, so, well, a lot, of course, the, the goal of a lot of these federal um, programs is to spur private spending. Um, but I, I would say that some of the funds are available through grants um, at the Department of Energy. And um, one of those is the, um, I think I had mentioned the Smart Grid um, Authority. And so if, if you're a developer working on a Smart Grid project, you'd be able to apply for a grant um, through, or a state, you'd be able to apply for a grant um, through um, the Department of Energy. But a lot of the funding does come through tax incentives, like there are tax incentives for transmission lines um, projects, there are tax incentives for wind and solar um, at the federal level, um, primarily. All right, thank you. And next question for Sarah. Um, any comments on the scalability of microgrids? 
Are these a long-term solution to modernizing the national grid? Um, also for, I think that one was for Jay. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm going just <laughs> right through it. You can answer too. <laughs> um, I think scalability as a standalone microgrid is difficult at this point because of the intermittent nature of um, you know, a lot of renewable resources that can be difficult and it's just not cost competitive with um, centralized um, sources. But I think the uh, microgrid is, um, it, it can be a long-term solution to modernizing the national grid because as a part of it, when, when it's now integrated into the larger grid, I really do think it could help with um, voltage support, frequency control, congestion management as it pertains to the larger grid. And as we start to integrate more electric vehicles into the system, um, I think that we can use microgrids in um, emergencies to pick up the local loads um, when there's a, an issue with the larger grid. So I do think standalone, it's difficult to tell at this point, and that's why you all are future engineers who's gonna solve this issue. Um, but when it's integrated into the larger grid, I do think that it is a, a long-term solution to um, a, a lot of the issues, capacity issues that we have with the, the transition lines and with the grid. Awesome, thank you. Um, this one is for Sarah. Does Ohio have goals for a minimum percentage of generation from renewables by 2030, 2040, something like that? Thanks to House Bill 6, no. Um, <laughs> so right now, Ohio's renewable energy standards is 8.5% through 2026, and then there's a cliff. Um, so the standards just end in 2026. Um, I will say that that's one of the good things about the Power Clean Future Ohio campaign. So we are seeing a lot of Ohio cities stepping up and making those commitments. Um, so the city of Columbus has committed to be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, I think Cincinnati is also 100% renewable energy by 2030, um, but they already have a 100% renewable energy um, aggregation contract. Um, and so we are seeing a lot of other like local communities stepping up and making those kinds of, of renewable energy commitments. Great, thank you. And Randy, can you talk more about the democracy part of the OEC's vision? Yeah, so this really came about, like I said, because um, you really can't have a clean environment without a healthy democracy. And so um, all of the problems we've seen with how gerrymandered Ohio is um, really spurred the organization to add democracy as a fourth pillar of our work. Um, and so we get very involved with, we've been very involved with the recent redistricting uh, fight that did not end as well as we had hoped, obviously. Um, I think, you know, we ended up with um, a four-year map um, that we, you know, our organization thinks is worse than the current lineup, which is pretty unbelievable. Um, and, you know, we did hear from, um, you know, from, from uh, you know, different folks uh, that were part of that on the Republican side that they were not really pleased with it either. Um, but they voted for it because they didn't think that we were going to be able to come to an agreement on that. So that was really unfortunate, but um, the OEC gets very involved in those pieces. We do a lot of public uh, education. So, um, and then uh, specifically on the redistricting effort, um, our staff attorney from our law center was actually on the Ohio Citizens Redistricting Commission. So trying to help um, make, make sure that those maps were fair, um, providing uh, input on what they should look like. Um, so, so always very involved in that. Um, you know, definitely check out if you're interested in our democracy um, uh, components, you can certainly check out our website and we've got a lot of different tools and um, trainings that we offer um, for local Ohioans so that they can get involved and, and get more understanding on um, how they can fight for a fair, um, fair maps as we move forward. Awesome, thank you. Um, Randy, just got another question. Do you know if there are any more national level initiatives similar to the Energy Jobs and Justice Act? Yes, actually, I'm pleased to report uh, that Illinois actually just passed something uh, very similar that was uh, wrapped in uh, clean energy workforce development, uh, carbon reduction, kind of the same uh, tenants that we are looking at to try to do here in Ohio. Um, and there was actually a really great article today um, uh, by, uh, in the, um, I'm trying to remember, uh, by um, 
Oh my goodness. I'm blanking on his name guys. Um, but there's a really great article today that was talking about um, how this is really setting the tone for the region and for the country, because there's really nothing else quite like this um, that, that Illinois passed. And, um, you know, we here in Ohio, we're really proud that this was rolled out yesterday. And those of us that are supporting this effort, um, because, you know, challenge accepted, um, we want to, we want to have the same, um, you know, exciting and equitable, uh, clean energy policies that they have in Ohio, because these are things that are going to lift up all Ohioans and they should be things that we're all supportive of, um, as we move forward to try to fight climate change, but also to make sure that we have an equitable, uh, environment, um, and really address some of the racial equity issues that have been heavily involved in this because it's very intersectional. Great, thank you. And this is for anybody. Is Ohio doing anything to increase interval data access for customers of utilities or third parties? Kind of. <laughs> there are a lot of cases at the Public Utilities Commission trying to address this problem. Um, I know we've been supportive um, over the several years in different um, grid modernization cases, but also just some of the other um, cases brought up by our utilities at the commission of different different components, like um, uh, to, to make sure that you, you know, you as residents have that access, but also that um, businesses have that access, because if you don't know um, as enough about your energy usage, it makes it really hard to control and reduce. Um, so, so those are really important uh, pieces and they don't, they're, they're really hard to convey. I will say um, when you're trying to talk about policy with the general public, it's really difficult to kind of uh, get folks to understand why that's so important because you start saying data access and people's eyes glaze over. Um, but there's a really great uh, organization and partner that we work with on occasion called Mission Data. So if you're interested in learning more about um, the different uh, ways we can make sure that we have better data access, I would highly recommend checking them out. Awesome, thank you. And this is also for anybody. What's it like being a woman in the clean energy field? I was like, I don't know who wants to go first. I just stopped talking, but <laughs> I can say, you know, for me, I have been um, pleasantly surprised. Uh, we work with a lot of different folks uh, across across our coalition of, uh, of organizations, you know, that we partner with. And there are a lot of women that are working in the clean energy space, a lot of us. Um, as you can tell, I mentioned Sarah and referenced her, uh, you know, uh, presentation several times. Um, she used to work at the OEC, sorry to call you out, Sarah, um, but we've worked together for a long time. And I'm really proud of the fact that there are so many strong women that are working in this industry. And I really love always partnering um, with you guys at UD because the engineering program is so strong. And I was not, uh, did not have the brain for engineering. So I went into law so I could fight for these things. And uh, I just really wanna encourage you if you're on this and you're um, somebody that's got an expert uh, expertise in engineering and all those different pieces, that is so important to what I do as an attorney. Um, if I could hire all of you as an expert all the time, I would. Uh, unfortunately, nonprofit life, you don't always have that luxury of getting an expert witness, um, but it's really, really critical. And so if you're interested in clean energy, know that there are lots of different ways to get involved other than just advocacy or law. Um, and I'll turn it over to Sarah and Jay, because I'm sure you have thoughts too. Yeah, um, I think for me, it was, I. so I started out and a lot of people, but I know you all know the difference, but a lot of people just didn't get the difference between environmental and energy. And I started out in environmental, um, doing environmental law, um, primarily on the siding process. Um, but then my firm did start to pick up a lot more solar energy um, projects. And that's how I got really interested and integrated into energy. But I found it really challenging at my firm in my environment, just because it was just, it was all men, it was all men. And I did not get to interact with women unless I went to conferences and found, and, and, you know, became more a part of organizations like Women in Energy. Um, and how I learned about this conference was through um, RISE, uh, women in renewable, ener renewable energy industry. Um, and so I think for me, it was really encouraging to have those avenues where I could connect with other women and learn from their experiences, especially as um, I was newer in my career at that point. And I, I, I still think I'm fairly new in my career and so has, you know, I have a lot to learn. Um, but, you know, I would echo what Randy said and, you know, to encourage you all to, you know, really uh, dig into those networks to find people that you can learn from and also learn how to navigate 
different <laughs> male dominated spaces. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I know, um, you know, for me, even though I have worked at OEC, I've actually been on uh, OSEF's leadership council since um, OSEF was started in, in 2015. Um, and then the, you know, Conservative Energy Network was launched in 2016. Um, and I can, I can say some of those very early meetings, um, you know, I was the only female, or maybe there might be, you know, one or two others, um, you know, with me. Um, and so, but now, you know, we're, we're a 21 state network, and we have um, probably six or seven uh, executive directors of states that are that are women. Um, and so we've, I've really seen um, a lot of, um, a, a lot of women stepping up into leadership roles throughout the network. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of space um, for women in clean energy. Um, and just echo what, you know, what, everyone else, what Randy and, and Jay have said, as far as, you know, being able to utilize the network and, um, you know, really get to, um, to, to know people and, and don't be afraid to reach out to us, um, you know, for, for advice or questions or anything like that either. All right, thank you very much. So, thank you so much for that. And then I think we have time for one more question. Um, are you seeing the private sector transitioning to clean energy and what is holding others from taking that next step? Money. Sounds like we probably all have opinions on this one, so. <laughs> yeah, I'll say um, we've actually seen, at least for Ohio, a lot of the, the clean energy transition is being driven by the private industry. Um, so, you know, we have um, companies like, you, you have your Googles and Amazons um, and Facebooks that are coming in with data centers and they, they want access to renewable energy. Um, but you also have your more traditional companies, so like Fifth Third Bank, um, Huntington Bank that are, are committed to 100% renewable energy. Um, Fifth Third was the first bank in the country actually, headquartered in Cincinnati, to go 100% renewable energy for not only their headquarters, but also all of their branches um, through a power purchase agreement uh, for a solar facility in, in like North Carolina, I think. So, um, it, and as somebody who advocates the state house, sometimes it's a little frustrating, especially on the conservative side, um, to be like, there are these businesses that want this. And when they want to locate in Ohio, their, their ask is, can I get renewable energy? Um, and so this is something that I think, you know, we really need to, to continue to kind of educate lawmakers on and hammer home as like, this isn't some, you know, pie in the sky, whatever wonky thing that they want to say or woke thing that they want to say about it. Like this is traditional businesses see like the, the economic and environmental benefits of this and, and they want to they want to expand it in the state and i think i'm oh, sorry go ahead jay oh, i'm literally just saying one sentence <laughs> um i think another key component of course you know are consumers and so the biggest users of facebook google you know they're catering to their clientele and so apart from you know the financial incentive which i think um, a lot of these policies we talked about are addressing those issues. It's, you know, if, they're, if their consumers aren't demanding um, renewable energy or renewable energy sources, they're, you know, they're, gonna, they're not going to want to change unless they see that financial benefit. Yep, I agree with that. And that was, you know, I'll pop this in the chat. This is the map that was too tiny that I had in my slides for anybody to see. But this shows how much utility scale solar is coming online. And that's being driven by businesses like Google and Facebook that are coming here and saying we need 100% renewable. And I will just, you know, call it the obvious. I mean, Sarah's right. We have trouble, uh, you know, with certain folks in the legislature. But we have a really big problem if we're going to start passing bills that um, like House Bill 201 and Senate Bill 52 that are um, really taking this out of uh, out of the hands of uh, a broader population that can see kind of what's happening across the state. Um, so, you know, I think that the state house is extremely problematic right now, obviously. Um, but, um, you know, I hope that, um, you know, we're, we're starting to have a different conversation as we get rid of the remaining pieces, hopefully of House Bill 6 and move on to something that can actually be um, helpful for the for the whole of Ohio, both on a, a climate perspective and on an economic perspective. All right, thank you guys. And with that, we are gonna go ahead and wrap this up. So thank you again, everyone for attending today's session. We are so excited that you were able to join us and we hope you've enjoyed today's session and learned a little bit more about clean energy regulation and policy. 
I would also like to mention that our final sessions of the conference are tomorrow, next Monday, and we'd really love it if you guys could attend those sessions as well. Um, again, thank you all for attending the conference tonight, and I hope you all have a great rest of your evening. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody.